Welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're so glad that you've decided to join us today. If you're a guest with us, we would love for you to fill out one of those connect cards in the pew right in front of you. We want to give you more information about the awesome opportunities we have here at New Hope to hear about Jesus. We do promise you a couple of things. One, that we're not going to come knock on your door. Two, we're not going to harass you by phone, but we do just want to send you a couple things in the mail to let you know about what we have here at New Hope Community Church. Here at New Hope Community Church, our passion, our desire, our vision is to compellingly communicate the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. We have a few ways that we can do that throughout the week, but this week's a little bit different. Good morning, New Hope. Hey, uh, Pastor Chris and the entire Mexico team are now in Rosarito doing exactly what he was just talking about, compellingly communicating the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ to a bunch of folks down in Rosarita area. So be praying for them this week. Now, it's going to be kind of a quiet week around here this week. Most of our Bible studies are not going to meet, but a few are, so pay attention here. Nan's Bible study on Tuesday morning is going to meet. Tina's Bible study on Wednesday evening is going to meet, and our two grief share meetings, Tuesday morning and Wednesday evening, are also both meeting. But the rest of them are taking the week off. So remember that and uh, have a quiet week. We're going to start Easter week off this week, Palm Sunday tonight. And uh, join Pastor Mark. Uh, they're going to preview uh, Franklin Graham's new short movie, Flying Blind. You don't want to miss that. Six o'clock this evening. Be there. Easter Sunday is next Sunday, everyone. We are so excited around here at New Hope. That is the day that we celebrate Jesus' victory over the grave. It's going to be a day that you don't want to miss. We have three service times where you can come and bring people to that. Make sure you get an invitation ticket to bring people to this. So our first service is going to be at 8 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. Our second one is at 930 and then our last one of the day will be at 11 o'clock. There's no Easter Sunday night service, so Sunday night service is canceled on that day. But come, bring somebody. Let's celebrate that Jesus Christ has victory over the grave. This Friday is Good Friday, and for the first time, we're having a Good Friday evening service. Come along at 6 o'clock in the sanctuary and see a slightly different presentation on the crucifixion of Jesus and what it can mean to anybody even those enemies of Jesus at the time. We'll have hot cross buns after. If you don't know what they are, come along and find out. So I'll see you at six o'clock in the sanctuary. Good Friday. One of the best ways to get connected and be part of the family is to serve here at New Hope with your gifts that God's given you. We wanted to make that easy for you. And so if you go on our website, newhopechurch.net, click on ministries right on the bottom you're going to see service opportunities go ahead and click on that link and it's going to take you to a whole page that you can scroll through that with needs that our ministry leaders have put up on there you can click on anyone that might be a good fit for you and email those ministry leaders directly it's one of the best ways to get involved and to be a part of the family Another way you can do that is to go on your mobile app. If you want to pull it out right now, go ahead. And you go to your menu on the mobile app and click on service opportunities. And that will take you to our webpage, the same place. And so do that, get involved, come be a part of the family. We'd love to see you. Hi, April 15th is our junior high camp pancake breakfast. It's where you can come here to church that morning, eat pancakes, um, between all the services and all proceeds um, go straight to our junior high summer camp. Uh, tickets are $5 or uh, family for $20. Um, you can purchase tickets today. Thank you so much for coming today. We're so glad you guys have decided to join us. We hope that today be a day that Jesus is sufficient for you.
Uh, ladies ministries, you all know when you meet, all right? So there's a little confusion between Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, but uh, those two are still meeting. Everything else is not meeting during the adventure of, of this week. Uh, I do want to add a little extra note to a couple of things. One, tonight's service at 6 o'clock. This is a uh, Billy Graham crusade uh, film that's been produced. Uh, Franklin does some of the narration in it. Uh, they're using the story of a pilot and flying, all right, and how there are times when you fly, you may want to trust what you see, and your instruments are telling you something different. So are you going to fly uh, by sight or by faith? And then they compare that to some real life examples. Four different stories are intertwined in that. It's 22 minutes long. It's very, very well done. I'm going to be here. Hope you come back tonight, six o'clock for the movie tonight. All right. I think you'll like it. While I'm speaking of movies, how many of you have now seen? I can only imagine. Raise your hand. Thank you very much for making it the number three movie last weekend in the country. Number three. All right. That's pretty awesome. Um, However, it is not the only faith-based movie that is out there right now. So let me highlight two others for you. The Apostle Paul is out. How many of you have seen it already? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Not near as many. Go see it. I hear it's very, very good. Uh, Shelly and I intended to go see two movies this weekend, and you'll find out why we didn't see them uh, this weekend in a few minutes. But Apostle Paul is on our list. And then there's another one I had not heard anything about. I got an email Thursday, and it was opening on Friday, and... The best I can tell so far, it's just going to be here for four days unless people show up to it, and it's only at one theater, which is at River Park. Uh, the title of the movie is called Getting Grace. Grace is a teenage girl, and Grace has cancer. She has a humorous personality. She's inquisitive, she is outspoken, and Grace wants to know what happens when she dies. And it's not just the spiritual side she wants to know about. She wants to know the very practical. Some of you are grimacing at me right now. This is, this, this is a comedy with a serious twist to it. Um, so what she does is she goes and bugs the local mortician in her neighborhood. And he doesn't like all of her questions. They unsettle him, all right? And the guy who plays the, the mortician um, is the guy who was the doofus lawyer in Matlock. You remember him? Okay, the, the guy who was kind of a doofus. He is the mortician. He's the one who produced this movie. Here is one of the lines out of the movie, because I got to see a small clip out of it. And um, here's, the, here's the key line. Some people get grace... Some people never do. Okay, now, remember, the girl's name is Grace, so there's this parallel meaning going on that's there. So, uh, my sister actually went and saw it yesterday uh, along with three other people. <laughs> there were four of them in the theater, all right? Four of them in the theater, all right? But it, I, like I said, we just found, usually we get things months in advance about faith-based movies. This showed up Thursday. So uh, I just wanted to highlight those two for you to, to, to go see as well. Uh, Friday evening, 6 to 7 o'clock, uh, here in the sanctuary, we're having a good Friday service. Uh, we'll be sharing communion. You are also going to hear a perspective of the crucifixion from one of the enemies a Roman soldier, all right, will be present making the message that night. And then uh, our associate pastor who has a bit of a British influence in his life uh, is sharing with us hot cross buns after the service out in the pavilion, all right? So if you don't know what that is, come and see what a hot cross bun looks like, all right? Uh, I mean, tastes like, okay? And yeah, tastes like. Uh, so anyway, uh, that should be wonderful. Uh, also, you may pick up uh, tickets that look like this. They're on the tables in the back. We passed them out last week. Uh, but pick up a handful of these, pass them out. Um, I've got to take a bunch back to the hospital for Dad. All right, today, Dad's been in the hospital since Thursday night. We'll give you an update on that. Uh, and the reason is because there was not a doctor or nurse who took care of Dad at some point uh, that he did not ask them, do you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior and where do you go to church? He asked every one of them, all right? Uh, I told Dad after the first few, I said, Dad, you might ought to wait till after the probing is finished. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, timing might be better, all right, till after they've done their investigative work rather than before. 
Uh, some of them answered very quickly, yes, I do, and I'm glad you do. And others said, you know, I'm not sure I understand that the way you do. And his response was, well, you need to. Okay? One lady said, I'm not sure. He said, you ought to be. All right? So uh, 92 years old, he's, you know, he's letting it all out there. All right? Uh, and so I got, he said, bring me some of those tickets. All right? And he's going to give it to those nurses and doctors. Um, so anyway, please pick some of those up and, and pass those out. Uh, next Sunday, all three services are here in the sanctuary. Please note the slightly different times, uh, 8, 9.30, and 11 uh, for our choir and message for Easter Sunday morning. Invite folks to come be with you. Let me highlight uh, a variety of prayer requests. First of all, we do have three memorial services next week. Uh, so remember Gary Gomes' family, uh, Jack Cornelius' family, and then Don Lacefield. And many of you, longtime Clovis resident, uh, many of you, Donnie Lacefield, uh, Lacefield Bonner Boats, all right, this is Donnie's dad, all right, and, and he were mem- they were members of Dad's church when I was growing up, so I've known them for a long time. That service is here on Friday at 11 o'clock, so if you'd remember those families, please. Uh, Irma McGuinn, uh, where are you, family? All right, all right, just putting the, the, putting the name and faces together over there, all right. Um, I shared with you last week that they diagnosed Irma with a tumor on her spine. Uh, That is accurate. Uh, In further testing this week, they have discovered that uh, she really has a lot of cancer throughout her body. That's the bad news. The good news is the doctors have diagnosed it as stage one. Okay, so uh, it's, it's at its earliest stage and believes it's very treatable to put it into uh, remission. And so, uh, but she's got quite a bit of pain as she has started treatment this week. So please be praying uh, for Irma and for their family. Milt Pierce, another part of our congregation, all right, usually part of the 1045 service. Uh, as you know, he went through a lot of chemo and radiation, uh, got good results, everything had shrunk down. He collapsed at home yesterday. Uh, members of his family had to administer CPR until uh, the ambulance arrived. He is at Fresno Community Hospital right now. Um, let's see here. I just got a text during uh, our opening song, and so I can give you update information. He is on a ventilator and a cooling blanket. He is in a medically induced coma. Uh, they are treating him for pneumoth- pneumothorax. Uh, Air has leaked into his chest cavity, putting pressure on his heart, but his heart rate is very strong. They are doing this treatment for 24 hours. So uh, that's an update on what's going on with Milt. So would you please be remembering to pray for him. Uh, The rights, wave rights. All right, all right. Um, I always tell them, isn't it great to never be wrong? They are always right. but they just, got, uh, they just got some news that they didn't like last night. Their daughter Luann, who has been in our church many times when she's up here visiting with them, uh, she's having a lumpectomy, second round of chemo treatments are starting, and uh, she's known it a little longer than they've known it. She wanted to keep it from mom and dad for a little while. And so they just found out last night. So uh, we want to be praying with the rights, all right, and, and with their daughter Luann as she goes through this treatment. So um, those are a few of the updates apart from, uh, let me tell the story of dad real quick because I've kind of let little bits and pieces out. Uh, Thursday night, I uh, got a Thursday late afternoon, I should say, around uh, 5 o'clock I got a call. Uh, can I get to dad's house? Uh, he seems, he's vomiting, he's got the chills, he shakes. Uh, he has a fever. Um, so I went over there fully expected to take to the doctor, realized he was not in very good shape at all. I probably couldn't get him to the car to take him anywhere. So we called for an ambulance. They took him to Clovis Community Hospital. Um, early indications was that uh, he probably had some gallbladder issues, but they needed to run a lot of tests. The emergency was a packed house that evening, uh, so bad that they made the announcement in the waiting room that we're only going to allow one uh, family member per patient in the waiting room. Everybody else either go home or go to the other side of the hospital and wait. Um, And so anyway, but we got pretty good care. They admitted him that night, but we stayed in emergency because they had no rooms uh, for two nights. Um, Took him a while to get some of the tests done and get doctors in. Once the doctors did show up, things moved very quickly, and they showed up about 5 o'clock last evening. Uh, Said his gallbladder needed to come out yesterday, so we are getting him in as fast as we can get a surgery room. He is worse than he looks. 
Um, and he, what happened is his gallbladder had shut down because of infection. It was now leaking infection back into his blood. So he was now septic, all right? And, and so he said, we've got to get on this right away. The heart specialist had just been there the hour before and said, if they could do surgery laparoscopically, I give my approval. If they can't, we have to renegotiate because we don't think his heart can handle uh, having him opened up. So um, really great, the this, this surgeon really liked him, Dr. Am- Amby. Uh, he is from Cameroon, all right? You know him? Oh yeah, I, I, man, he walked in and he is confident and he said, uh, we got a lot of hope in this room because dad asked him right away if he knew Jesus. And, <laughs> and so uh, he said, we got a lot of hope in this room and, uh, I, and my dad started telling him, hey, it's okay if you, know, if, you, if, if you do your best and it's not good enough, I know where I'm going and this is the right time. And he said, hey, we got, not on my watch, maybe somebody else's watch, not on mine. Uh, and, and so, um, we were beginning to wonder cause a one hour surgery became three hours. We finally came out about 1130 last night and said it had gone well. It was just harder. Um, and so I saw him this morning before first service. Uh, he looked better. His heart rate and everything was normal. A little confusion still because of all of the, uh, anesthesia and pain medication. They said that will clear up more and more as the day goes by. Uh, but he's not completely out of the woods yet. He's still on antibiotics, will be for a few days, has a drain in. Uh, he is at Clovis Community Hospital, and um, things look good today. So, uh, but look, did, did look necessarily great yesterday. Uh, but he's just using it as an evangelistic outreach uh, at the moment. So uh, be praying for him. Yeah. Um, so anyway, those are the updates. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Draw your attention to the video screen for a short uh, Palm Sunday video. And right after that, our kids will be taking the stage and singing for us on this Palm Sunday morning. Would you join with me as we pray as our ushers come forward? Father, I love you. I thank you for your sufficiency this week. Uh, Uh, hospitals really aren't all that bad a place. And uh, thank you that uh, when you are there with us, you make it so much better. Uh, Father, thank you for the provisions in dad's life over this past weekend. Thank you for uh, the strength and sufficiency you're giving to the McGuinn family as they care for Irma and for a good night's rest that she had last night. Lord, for the right family, I I pray for them. Uh, I don't care how old you are, um, you're still mom and dad. And so uh, we just pray for Phil and Hazel as they process the information they got last night from their daughter. We certainly commend her needs to you. Thank you for her strong faith in you and her trust in you as she faces this time. And um, this, this, is, this is when we can tell the difference between a casual faith and a committed faith. And so thank you for the strength you'll provide for them at this moment. For the Laceville family and the Gomes family and the Cornelius family and Lord, I'm sure others that we don't know about, but for these families that uh, New Hope will be engaged with, we certainly commit to you their needs. Pray for your strength to be evident in the needs of these families. Um, Lord, for uh, Milt, as he is at Fresno Community today and uh, going through the challenges that he's facing, we again pray for... um, for your availability to all the needs this family is going through and how you can use any of us. Lord, we pray for our kids. 54 from our church are down in Mexico. Uh, They left here uh, almost right on time yesterday morning. They arrived uh, all very safe in, uh, in, in their area out of Rosarita. Thank you for this week of ministry and blessing that you will give to them. For our privilege of giving and sharing today, Father, we say thanks. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Way to go, guys. Wow, the adult choir is now nervous for next Sunday. All right? They're a little nervous. Hey, I want you four guys to come out here. I want the four men to step forward real quick. All right? All right, Tyrone, come out here, buddy. All right, all right. High five for you guys. You are courageous men to sing with all of these women. All right? So great job. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, guys. Good job. Good job. Way to go, guys. Good job. Good job, guys. Outstanding, outstanding, outstanding. (laughs) 
Bye. I don't know about you guys, but that never gets old. All right, that never, ever gets old. And, and you know what I love about that is they are, oh, he decided to come back. He likes mom better, okay? All right. Um, 50 years from now, those songs are still going to be meaningful to them. What they learned today is going to have great value later on. Um, there was a little boy who was sick on Palm Sunday morning, and he had to stay home from church with his mother. And his father returned from church holding a palm branch. The little boy was curious and said, Dad, what do you have a palm branch for? And, and, and Dad said, well, you see, when Jesus came to town, everybody waved their palm branches to honor him. They threw them down on the streets. So, so we got palm branches today at church. The little boy said back to Dad, oh, shucks. The one Sunday I miss is the Sunday Jesus shows up. So, <laughs> Well, I got news for you. Jesus shows up more than one Sunday, all right? It's just sometimes we don't recognize his presence. This morning, as most of you know, it is Palm Sunday. Uh, it's the day taken from all four of the Gospels. You'll find it in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And just a side note, you heard the two guys talk about it during the offertory. What we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was written about 520 years earlier. You can go read the book of Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine, and it will tell you 520 years before it happened exactly what the four gospel writers wrote about. Palm Sunday is the triumphal entry of Christ into the city of Jerusalem. Palm Sunday is the first day of Passion Week. And it is the beginning of the last week of Jesus' earthly life. It was on this day that Jesus made his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. And in some denominational churches, they have a season that is called Lent, where they prepare their hearts for Easter Sunday by giving up something. And it goes back to the donkeys. The guy who owned the two donkeys that two disciples went and brought back to Jesus, he gave them up. And so people continuously give up things for Lent, and really what we're doing is we're giving up things for Jesus. The big idea on Palm Sunday is, is that we, we see that Jesus arrives in a celebratory mood into Jerusalem. He then cleanses the temple, and then he does some wonderful things. I'm going to read a lot out of Matthew's gospel if you want to turn there, chapter 21. Uh, I'll be reading from a little bit from Luke and a little bit from John as well. Uh, but I'm going to jump in right at Matthew 21, verses 1 through 3. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and they came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, and we don't know if it was Andrew and Tony. We don't know. And he said to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anybody says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. We don't know much about the man who owned this donkey, but when he heard that the Lord has need of it, he gave it. And so a question for us today is what is Jesus asking of you that he has need for? What part of your life have you held in reserve that Jesus would love for you to give to him? What will you do with your talents, gifts, resources, and opportunity that God has provided for you? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't necessarily, from my perspective, say that a hospital bed and an ER is an opportunity. But to my 92-year-old father, it was an opportunity it was not an opportunity necessarily for doctors and nurses to tend to his problem. Dad was more concerned about as a pastor tending to their problems. Do you know Jesus? Where do you worship? What will you do with the opportunities, the talents, and resources that God has provided you? We don't know the name of the man who owned the two donkeys, but he's been talked about every Easter ever since then. He has gone down in history. Verse 4, all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And by the way, uh, when Jesus commands, you ought to do what you're told. <laughs> These guys did. They brought the donkey and the colt. They laid their clothes on him and they set him on it. 
Jesus entering Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Jesus left heaven and came to earth and he entered through the womb of a virgin girl in a barn in a place called Bethlehem. Not very fancy for a king, is it? And Jesus said, though keen I am, I didn't come as a keen to be served, but I came as a keen who would serve. And Jesus entered Jerusalem, not on the back of a white stallion, which would have been appropriate for a keen, but you know what the people may have thought if he had ridden in on a stallion? That Jesus was there for war. See, white stallions represented war. Jesus came on the back of a donkey. You heard the two comedians talk about it. It was a symbol of peace. Jesus didn't come to sit on an earthly throne. You see, a lot of the folks there wanted a new political ruler. They were frustrated with Rome. And I don't care who is president of the United States, there's a portion of this country that's never satisfied. And here's a deal you and I got to get figured out. It's not Republican or Democrat or Independent that is going to make a difference in the contentment of your heart. It is not who sits in the White House or on the throne of a kingdom, but it's the one who sits in the seat of authority in your life that makes a difference. And Jesus came to Jerusalem on the back of a donkey because he said, I am the Prince of Peace. I have come to bring your heart what no politician or political influence can ever bring to you. I come to be your Savior, Lord, and King. Jesus rode into Jerusalem much like we have the first weekend in April in Clovis, a parade, and the people flock down the side of the streets to recognize a rodeo's coming to town. On that day, they recognized that Jesus was coming to town, and they rolled out the red carpet. Verse 9, And the multitudes who went before those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's another prophecy fulfilled in the book of Isaiah. Hosanna in the highest. And when he came to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude says, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. The people are very passionately worshiping and praising a coming king. In Luke's gospel, he said, Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Notice they were not praising him for who he was. That's the failure. They praised God for what he did, not for who he was. See, just to say thank you is good manners. To worship is a good choice. That day they had good manners. <laughs> but when you make bad choices, it won't be long before your manners turn bad. And in just a matter of three to four days, they realized they were making bad choices and their manners became very, very poor. The same people who yelled, here comes the king, are the same people who said, crucify him. He deserves to be dead. Uh, notice if you were to look in Matthew's gospel, uh, the next thing that, that Jesus does after he rides into the city, and, and if I took the time but I don't have it today, the scripture says the next thing Jesus did is he went to the top of a hill and he looked down at the city of Jerusalem and he wept over them. He had just been honored with a parade. But you see, Jesus knew to look beyond the words of their lips and he looked at the intent of their heart. And so he went to the top of the hill and he looked down at Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chicks under my care and my love, but you would have nothing to do with me. And Jesus wept. And then notice what Jesus does next. He goes to the heart of the matter. Verses 12 through 13. Matthew 21. Then Jesus went into the temple of God. The temple in Jerusalem was to be the center place of the presence of God in the nation of Israel. And when Jesus got there, he didn't like what he found. The next passage says, and Jesus drove out all of those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. 
Right after Jesus came to town, he went to the temple and cleansed it. Jesus wants his temple, and what's the temple of God today? It's your life and mine. The Bible says, Paul wrote, the Apostle Paul, you can go see the movie about this week. The Apostle Paul said, our bodies are now the living temple of a holy God. Jesus went to the temple and he cleansed it. He wants our lives to be a house of prayer, of ministry, and blessing. And that won't happen until we let him get out of our lives and out of our hearts those things that pollute us. What things are in your life that might hinder you from experiencing all that Jesus has promised us? Maybe it's time for a little temple cleansing. And then verse 14, Jesus does some wonderful things. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But notice, nothing good happened until it was cleansed. The miracles in your life will not be evident to you or to anybody else until you take care of the crud in your world. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said, yes. <laughs> have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. When Jesus did all the wonderful things, transforming of lives, it came after the temple was cleansed. In, in verse 20 of that same chapter, excuse me, in John chapter 12, verse 20, Je John picks up a little bit that Matthew and Luke leave out. In verse 20 of John 12, it says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda of Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, Jesus is predicting his own death in just a matter of hours. If I don't fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternity. If anyone serves me... Let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, him my father, her my father, will honor. Let's spend this week, beginning today, preparing our hearts for Easter by seeking Jesus. That's what the Greeks said they came to Jerusalem for. I don't know why you came today. You might have come to hear kids sing because they're your grandchildren your neighbor kids, and that's good. But I hope you've come to find Jesus. It's a promise that changes the course of our life forever. So let's spend this week preparing our hearts for Easter by looking for him. Let's remember who Jesus is and what he has done for us, and let's be like the Greeks. Let's have a desire to find him. You know, we've been preaching about open doors over the past couple of months, and in this particular story of Palm Sunday, I see particularly in the owner of the two donkeys an open door of availability and readiness. He had no idea when two disciples showed up at his corral that they were going to steal his donkeys. But when they said the Lord has need of them, no questions asked. Are you and I that quick when God asks for something of us to say, they're yours? I had to do that last night with my father. When one hour turned to two and two hours turned to three, I looked at each other and said, this just may be home going time. And it's okay. In fact, I think Dad really is the only one disappointed this morning. <laughs> he told his sisters, I'm going to see a whole bunch of people tomorrow. And, and it will happen. We also see here the door of submission and obedience that the owner of the donkeys was willing to walk through. And they also walked through the door of faith and trust. Hey, those are my possessions, but if God needs them, they're his. This day is bittersweet. As most of you know, Palm Sunday is not my favorite Sunday because I think the Pharisees were very hypocritical. Uh, they, they cheered him one day and they crucified him the next. I, I want to just, before I wrap things up today, uh, focus our attention um, on, a, on, on a couple of principles out of this story. 
It was Billy Graham who just went home to be with Jesus, probably the world's greatest evangelist next to John the Baptist. Billy Graham has been quoted many times as saying that the greatest mission field in our country today is our local church, the people already sitting inside. I'm not sure if that statement is true or not, but one thing I do know is, is that many people know what to say, how to say it, even how to act upon it, but when the rubber truly meets the road, there's no personal relationship with Jesus Christ, no salvation, just, just a lot of empty words. We see a perfect example of this in our passages this morning. On Sunday, Jesus rides into the city with the people shouting for him about all the wonderful things that he had done. And yet, come Thursday or Friday, they are shouting, give us Barabbas, the murderer and the thief. Crucify Jesus. You see, they had a custom in those days that they could set one person free. Two criminals, one could be set free. So they gave him a choice, Jesus or Barabbas. Jesus, who's done miracles and raised the dead. Barabbas, who kills people and steals their stuff. Who would you like set free? I'm, I'm convinced they all must have been Californians because they set the, ca the criminal free, all right? <laughs> that was not in my notes. That was purely a spontaneous. I can't believe I said that out loud. Um, but, but that's what they did. That's what they did. There's a lot of possible reasons, but one simple reason is, is the words of their lips did not match the intent of their heart. And remember, the scripture says that Jesus knows the intent of our hearts. You see, so many on the streets of Jerusalem possessed a casual faith, not a committed faith. Many of them were Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders. You see, these were people who had religion but they had missed a relationship with Jesus Christ. So how do we in 21st century culture have a committed faith rather than a casual faith? How can we be real and sincere, consistent in, in, in what we do as well as what we say? Let me offer a couple of suggestions. Number one, the first key is that a committed faith is not self-centered, it is Christ-centered. I know that sounds so obvious, but often we miss it. We tend to say to God things like, hey God, here's my calendar, here's my agenda, now I might be able to squeeze you in here and here. Pulling God out or turning to God only when it's convenient or useful for me. In this passage, the people praised Jesus as he passed by for two reasons. First, because of the miracles he had done, and second, because they saw in Jesus a political deliverance from the Romans. They wanted a change of circumstances, not a change of heart. A few days later at the trial, they saw the beaten and disfigured Jesus, and they figured, he's no longer our guy. He no longer looks like a deliverer or a conqueror, and since it wasn't going to help them, and since, no, and since because life was always all about me, we're hearing that word me a lot today in our culture. But not much has changed in 2,000 years. And so they turned away from Jesus and turned to Barabbas. There's a legend about an ancient village in Spain. The villagers learned that a king was going to pay them a visit. It's the first time in a 1,000 years that a king had ever come to this small village. Excitement grew. We have to throw a big celebration, and everybody agreed. But it was a poor village, and there weren't a lot of resources, so someone came up with a classic idea. Since most of the villagers grew their own uh, grapes and produced their own wine, the idea was that everybody would bring uh, one large goblet of their best wine, and they would pour it in a vat they would mix it all together and they would offer it to the king for his pleasure when the king draws from the vat he will be drawing the very very best the day before the king's arrival hundreds of people lined up to make their offering to the honored guest they climbed a small stairway poured their gift into a small opening at the top finally the vat was full Soon after that, the king arrived, and he was escorted to the town square. He was given a silver goblet, and he said, draw some wine. This is the best our village has to offer. He placed the cup under the spigot, and then he turned the handle, and he filled up his goblet, and then he drank the wine. But what he discovered is it was nothing more than water. You see, every villager reasoned. I will withhold my best wine so I can enjoy it myself. I will substitute water, thinking one glass of water with everybody else's best wine. Nobody will notice. 
And every one of them brought the same thing, water. The key question is, not what is best for me. The key question here is what is best for the kingdom. I, I, I counsel young couples, or sometimes they're not so young. I counsel couples who are getting married. And one of the things that I tell every couple is this. The key question in your life now changes. Up till now, your key question has been, what is best for me? What's best educationally? What's best job? What's best finance? You're, you're making decisions really solely on what's best for you because you're the only one you have to think about. But now that you get married, the Bible says two become what? One. So now the key question is no longer what is best for me, but what is best for us. And sometimes what is best for us just happens to turn out to be the same answer as what is best for me. Sometimes, not often, but occasionally. And sometimes the answer to the question what is best for us turns out to be the same answer as what is best for your spouse. But more often than not, the answer to what is best for us is not best for either one of us separately, but it is what is best for us together. Does that make sense? So now when we invite Jesus Christ into our life, the question no longer is what is best for me, but God, what is best for me is part of your kingdom that makes a difference in your influence in the world. Um, that's just the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's an open door. It's an open door, which means I'm supposed to shut up, I guess, but almost, almost. The second key to a committed faith is that this is relationship driven. Not only is it to be Christ centered, but it's relationship driven. Many of those who gathered to throw their coats and palm branches in the street and who just were gonna shout for Jesus, at that one brief moment, they did it because it was trendy and popular. Everybody else was doing it who had lined the streets, so they joined in. Perhaps a few of them had sincere motives, but others simply did it because it's the thing to do. Later in the week at the trial, shouting, crucify him, that became the thing to do. In fact, for a brief moment, it was the trendy thing to make a mass murder criminal their hero, and they yelled for Barabbas. In our own lives, a committed faith comes only through a personal relationship with Jesus, one where every day is fresh and new, and he can personally direct our steps. In order to have a committed faith, we must develop and maintain a personal relationship with Jesus. And then the third key to a committed faith is, not, is, is this idea that we are not to be swayed or blocked by our personal trials and crises. At the parade, it was trendy to offer praise. Everybody was doing it, but at the trial, to speak out for Jesus was very risky, possibly even life-threatening. Many of us came to Jesus expecting everything to turn out good for us, but maybe some slight bad, but not much is okay. But when the bottom drops out, we often ask God, why are you doing this? I had the opportunity yesterday, I got a text from some friends that um, they had some friends who, has some friends whose son is in ICU and on life support. He's 39 years old. He went in for a simple scope procedure and then he aspirated into his lungs. He's been on life support ever since. Um, important decisions are made. I, I, I'd never met them. I walked in and, and into the room and I introduced myself and, and they said, oh, you're a pastor. They said, yeah. And I said, I was asked. I said, well, we, we, we're, we're from Keensburg and we go to such and such a church. I said, that is terrific. And I said, don't mean to intrude, but you mind some prayer? And they said, no, as, as, as long as you, you, you pray in agreement with us. I said, well, tell me how you're praying. We're praying for an absolute miracle. I said, that's wonderful, but you know, miracles come in different sizes and shapes, and sometimes what we want as a miracle is not what God has designed for a miracle. I said, let me tell you how, if I pray, I'm going to pray for your son. It's how I pray for everyone. I said, I don't like putting God in a box. And he said, oh, yeah, no, neither do we. I said, that's wonderful, so here's how I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that God knows better than I know what to pray for, so I'm going to pray for his best. And sometimes his best 
is to take us home because we can't see the big picture. There may be a nurse or a doctor or another patient inside this area of the hospital who needs to see what faith looks like when the bottom drops out. And it's you he's going to show it to through. They thought about it for a moment. They said, okay, you can pray. <laughs> it's true. You see, sometimes we have an idea that what we think is best is also what God thinks is best. But are you going to trust my opinion or God's opinion? Are you going to trust God's opinion or your opinion? It's a very, very important question. And so we should not allow our faith to be dictated by our circumstances or our situation. Let me wrap this up because people are wanting to come in. A story is told of a little girl who, while walking in a garden, noticed a very beautiful flower. She admired the beauty and the fragrance of this flower, and she said, it is so pretty, and it smells so good. As she studied the flower, she then looked at the stem and the leaves, and she went all the way, and then she saw it was in the dirt. She couldn't stand for something so beautiful to be in the dirt. And so she pulled it out and ran to the faucet and she washed all the dirt off the roots. And as you can imagine, in just a matter of minutes, that flower wilted and died. A short time later, the gardener walks in and he sees his beautiful flower in her hand, dead. And he said, what have you done? And she said, oh, oh I'm so sorry, but I, I couldn't stand such a beautiful thing to be in the dirt. And he said, darling, don't you understand? I wanted to grow a flower more beautiful than any other. I chose the place. I mixed the dirt. I placed the seed right where it needed to be so it could fulfill all the desires I had for it. God knows where you are. God knows what situations and struggles and challenges he has allowed, permitted, or sent your way, and he's done it for a purpose so that you and I can be the beauty of his creation in us. The removal of the junk in our life will often destroy the tapestry of the work that he has done. True contentment comes when we accept what God is doing in and through our lives, and we thank Him for it. <laughs> Last three lines. <laughs> this morning, I'm asking you this question. Is your faith casual or committed? As you approach this week, Jesus suffered incredibly for us. In a week where our sins, past, present, and future, were the nails that put Jesus on a cross, doesn't he deserve a deeper look from us this week? Palm Sunday remains for us a dress rehearsal for the day of the Lord. You see, some of those who rehearsed on Palm Sunday never made it to the finale. We have dress rehearsal today that prepares us for the day of the Lord that is to come. So I suggest to you, get right with God. Don't put it off till tomorrow or Thursday or Friday. Do today what you know you should do today. Welcome the Savior with open arms into your heart and your soul and let him reign as king. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and for what it pictures and represents of history and of our relationship with you. I pray that each of us will ask the serious question, is my faith casual or is it committed? And Father, I pray we will make the right choice. First Easter week, very few did. So many didn't. I hope we turn that around this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you all hurry up and get out this door, all right, and let those people in that door, all right? Thank you very much.